going on everybody welcome to the latest episode episode six of the la report with your hosts eris morrison and linjo kilo yes sir and welcome back you guys we appreciate you rocking with us we five episodes in as of last episode this is again our sixth episode um appreciate all the love and support um today's episode we're gonna get right into it uh, we're going to talk about our experience, um, what it felt like being out in the trenches of the protests um, live here from D.C., um, what that was like, what uh, kind of how we felt about it and just things we saw and heard. Um, and then we're going to start a conversation, which will probably end up being um, a multi-episode piece um, where we're talking about defunding the police and what that means and how we can go about achieving it to be the best way for, you know, for our communities. Um, so with that being said, um, Linjo, you could start it off for us and tell us about your experience with the protests and how you felt about it. No, for sure. Appreciate that, bro. Um, man, to be honest, man, the protest was refreshing, bro. Cause, um, these past two weeks have been, uh, pretty rough mentally and emotionally just because you know having to deal with like um going to the going to a funeral if our, our friend's funeral and then having to deal with um you know the stuff surrounding george floyd social media people posting about it and then on top of that having to deal with um stuff in 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 the workplace having to you know having to be i guess the voice of black people in the workspace you know what i'm saying but um, other than that, man, the, the protest was really refreshing to go out there and be around such positive energy, how people being in unison, working towards one goal. It, it's, it's really it's really crazy the kind of energy and the kind of um, movement that unity can create. And it kind of makes you think, like, damn, if people were to get on the same page, like, a lot of shit can get done, man. People are very powerful when we're in numbers. You know what I'm saying? You know the saying goes... Uh, Divided we fall. Yeah, I think United, so, yeah like that. United we stand. Divided. We stand. Divided we fall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, that's how I felt, man. I was, I was really, I was, I just felt really empowered, man. I was, I felt empowered. I felt encouraged, and it kind of gave me like a new bolt of energy to like, you know, keep the fight going and you know keep this thing sustainable because, you know, the last thing we want to do is go out here and protest because we got nothing to do, and then five months from now or two months from now we just forget about shit. We back in our phones and back on social media just you know, talking every day. We want to be make, turn this energy into actionable items that can be tangible, man, because like you said, like we, we always say, we want to continue the fight of our ancestors and to continue to push towards real change and um, this idea of, of equality. You feel what I'm saying? So uh, I was I was refreshed and I was renewed by the protest. And I, I couldn't agree anymore, man. I think, uh, I think the best word uh, that you kind of used to describe it was empowering. Um, you know, I heard multiple people kind of say, you know, for our generation, um, for at least the context that it that it meant to us, you know, this was the closest thing to a million man march um, that we've seen. Um, and just seeing all the people out there, again, not just black, but white, every a, a lot of people of all race and ethnicities, um, you know, screaming and shouting Black Lives Matter um, was a very dope scene to see and to be a part of. Um, you know, my biggest takeaway was just, you know, D.C. coming and showing out. Um, you saw a lot of our culture on display, um, which 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 was great. You know, what I'm saying like this was this was this showed at least at least from my perspective, you know, obviously D.C. is we're all a part of this pie um, as far as, you know, the black race and, and, and black culture. But um, just seeing D.C. show up and show out and 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 put our talents on display. Um, it was like, it was a day of protest, but it also was a day of like, just like I said, of culture. Um, and I thought that both of them really blended themselves in well together, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I thought the protest was effective, um, but like you said, you know, you don't wanna continuously um, have it to where we go out protest and nothing change, I think we all know by now the only way things are going to change is through legislation 
um, and and us making the making change through our our use of our vote. Um, and so hopefully we all can keep this same energy moving forward into the, the fall elections. Um, but one thing I did want to say, like, you know, somebody with that uh, with that uh, bullhorn or whatnot, what they should have really said, while it was great seeing white folks out there screaming Black Lives Matter, you know, again, this goes towards legislation and legislating things as far as, you know, we're talking about police brutality, obviously. But like the one thing that we're also talking about is, you know, economic, economically uh, being able to benefit from fair, uh, fair practices in the workplace and all of these type of things, equitable compensation and, and reparations. You know, the one thing that they really have to put out there for white folks is and pose the question to them. You know, it's great that y'all say Black Lives Matter, um, but like are you willing to give up your privilege? You know, are you willing to give up something you weren't born with any right to have, but has been bestowed upon you due to the color of your skin? And I think that that's a question that, you know, in the coming months as legislation starts to get passed, you know, that's what I feel like we'll see the true colors of, of our white allies um, really come to, come to, come to fruition. No nah, man, that's that's um that's very powerful that you said that man. That 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 really, that brings up this video that I saw. I forgot the professor's name, but it was a, a room full of white folks. She, she, the professor was white as well, and she asked them. She was like, "If you were to anyone here wants to trade, would we'll, we'll really trade places with black people based on how we treat them? Who would do it?" And no one in the crowd raised their hand. And that to me was so powerful because it was like white people are not oblivious to what's going on. They know exactly what it is. But like you said, they're not willing to give up their privilege. They're not willing to give up, you know, their so-called stature in this society, in this twisted ass society that we live in. You feel what I'm saying? Like like you said, are they really willing to give that up and really decide, hey, we're going to be equal with everyone else. Everyone else is going to be equal in this thing together. Right. You know, and like you said, and like you said, we're going to definitely see. Come come November, bro. We're going to definitely see. And you know, I just encourage our listeners, man, to really keep your eyes peeled to see what happens next because that's going to be the biggest test is you know, if these people are really for us or really against us. Like, I be seeing on Instagram people, you know, berating other white folks to say something on their Instagram or company to say something. I'm like, okay, I'm with it. Yes, I definitely want people to acknowledge what's going on, but I'm not satisfied by you making making a post. I want to see some action and I want to see some real, some legitimate change, you know. And also on top of that, we as black folks, we have to give ourselves some slack too, like. Although our condition in this country is horrible, right? And you know, but we are making progress. You know what I'm saying? Although it may not, it may not show right now. It may not feel like we are, but we are. People have to understand: slavery ended 155 years ago. Facts. Uh, only 155 years ago, the NFL was founded 101 years ago, almost. 100, 100, 100 years was last year, so 100 years ago. Think about that. There are people still living today that have that are one generation removed from slaves. Meaning, like, like you have great grand, you have a, a, a grandchild or, or grand. Or say you have a a grandparent and their parent was a right. slave, and those folks are still alive today. So, if we can wrap our minds around that for a second and understand that, yes, we're still there's still a long way to go, but we can still look back and say, yeah, we came a long way. Let's stay encouraged as we move on through this fight because, you know, don't let social media take, uh, um, you know, take our energy away or discourage us, man. We, we're really making good progress and we're doing things that we're supposed to be doing. So let's, you know, cut ourselves some slack because we're, we're, we're doing good shit, man. Um, but yeah, that kind of brings us into like the next topic with, with um, legislation and 
reform is this this phrase has been going around um defund the police mm-hmm. um you know and I, I definitely want to get your opinion on it and what you think that 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 phrase means and or you can you explain what, what that phrase means to you so you know i think uh you know going so i think the phrase defund the police um what it means I think what it means uh, from a literal standpoint and from um, a figurative standpoint are two different things. Um, I think when we say defund the police, what most people mean um, is the figurative um, sense, um, which is cut the budgets of these uh, police departments and use some of that money or a lot of that money into resources that are sorely needed, um, education, um, mental health services, um, job opportunities. Um, I would, I'm, I'm a proponent of, um, a biggest thing for education. Um, just to piggyback off what you said earlier, like as, as much as we still are behind in this country, like, information is out there for us to really come up. And I know people say like, nah, that's not true, but it is because you have a lot more of our individuals, a lot more young people in our positions that are educated, that have voices that if combined that education and that voice with the power of actual um, economics and actually learning the, the game for what it is, I think we would be in a lot stronger position uh, financially to really be able to do some things. So I think, um, you know, I I believe that is very much true, but I do believe again, defunding the police is necessary. However, I think when you ask politicians and why um, politicians and maybe other people aren't really supportive of that initiative all the way is because I think me and you had a brief convo where, you know, if you look up the word defund, you're trying to, you're actually trying to dismantle or to, um, in some ways, dismantle um, something to end it, to put an end to it. And so um, I think that's more of the literal sense where people look at defund the police and why they're not necessarily on board because they don't, they believe that you're trying to dismantle them or have them cease to exist. And a lot, I mean, there's, there's, to be honest, there's, 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 there's both sides of that. You know, there's people out here who actually want that to be to, when they say defund the police, they actually want to dismantle the police as well, um, or use defund to dismantle. Um, but most people I'm assuming, including myself, I would probably say defund means obviously we know we need police officers. We definitely need we need a lot more than just reform um, because reform has been happening for decades, you know, and shit still is fucked up. Um, But I definitely think defunding the police is something that has to take place um, because from a logical standpoint, it's kind of simple. You defund the police, you put more resources in um, education and mental health and really trying to help help people, you'll have less encounters with the police, in which case there will be less things to kind of happen where police are have to be involved with over-policing or involved in like killings of obviously unarmed black people. But um, it is a tough dynamic because systemically we in the inner city are on top of each other which creates an environment of jealousy amongst ourselves and seeing people have and you don't have creates a level of crime that requires um, police. So while defunding them is a great way to solve one issue, we can't really be naive into thinking that another issue won't arise if not properly executed. Yeah, I agree 100, 110% with that, bro. I think, like like you said, man, a lot of people have have 
are, I don't want to say misinformed or miseducated, but a lot of people are just confused on the phrase defund the police and what that actually means. Like you said, defunding the police literally means, you know, to abolish them and to you know, dismantle their, their existence. Like you said, that's not what we want, especially in our inner cities, because like you said, people are on top of each other. And as you all know, humans operate in, in, in proximity. So you're going to love, kill, and do business with those that are, are closest around you. That's just the that's just human nature. So yes, we do need police officers to, you know, stand as a presence to deter some of these crime and some of these, you know, um, bad things from happening. But like I do, I do agree also that we need to take some of their funding and put it towards different causes. But that's not the the end of that. That's not the the solution. The solution, like is everything in this country, East in America, lands back to me to politics, where if we don't have control or have a political foothold within our education system, it don't matter how much money we take from the police and put it towards, towards education that money will never trickle down to the places that we wanted to go to because we don't have a say so on how shit is, is, is controlled. You know, people vote on who's on the board of education. People vote for who their superintendent is. You know, saying so you walk someone right now in DC, the average, the average Washingtonian probably doesn't know who is on the, their board of education or who runs the education department, the education department in, in DC. Same thing with Maryland or in Virginia. A lot of folks, that's not necessarily common knowledge. Well, it is it's public knowledge, which is public knowledge, but that's not common knowledge. And I say that to say, cool. Let's say, for example, they just, uh, the mayor just, they said that she just, that she just approved 19 million to MPD. Let's say that, let's say that 19 million is, is given towards D DCPS. Now, who on the DCPS board is going to make sure that kids at Baloo or Anacostia, or McKinley Tech, or any of these schools that are, you know, struggling per se, who want to make sure that they get that money? So who who's empowered to make sure that those those kids get that get those resources? So we have to we have to take into account that yes, we need funding funding to be redirected. We'll be always 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 have to have control of the political landscape to make sure that the, the money gets trickled down. Because if not, it's going to be a waste. So we're going to take money from the police and put more money into these these these, these quote unquote white schools. You know what I'm saying? And the kids that really need the money will never see it. And we're back in this perpetual circle of struggle and disenfranchisement and marginalization and all kind of shit that we're that we're fighting against. Especially in America's context, we have to have a political stronghold. We have to. We have to. If not. You know what I'm saying? We're gonna be continue we're gonna to continue to lose 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 it at this game. Nah, you man, know? you're absolutely right. I think that, you know, again, you know, the police are a big issue here in the United States. There is systemic racism when it comes to the police, you know. Um people don't wanna admit that. Like I said, we have frat brothers who are police officers who put themselves out there and, you know, try to do the best that they can to make a living, um, to make a, a difference, you would hope. Um, and the reality, though, is that systemically um, what transpires in the inner cities, especially with police um, and black and black and brown people, um, is just is really criminal. And so we have to take some of those resources away um, and you know, we have personal insight, um, you know, I won't go into too much in detail, but you can see how we know that people consume a certain amount of overtime, right? That overtime is being allotted due to the budgets that they have, you know, people just working just to work. And, you know, even when you consider that, you know, people don't even think about it, but like psychologically working that amount of overtime or always being on the clock you need your body needs rest and sleep and and to recharge too and when it doesn't have those abilities as well you put yourself into a state where you're irritable where you're not clear thinking where you react when you're not supposed to and it's not making excuses because again this goes to making sure that when you defund them you understand like why it's, it's kind of necessary to defund some of the funds that they receive um but 
just I'm also not a proponent of, you know, to your point, you know, where would these funds be directed to? Like, I just think for, like I said, for me personally, not to get off on too much of a different path of defunding the police. But again, I, I'm a proponent of, man, like, I got so many books that I picked up and read. Like, I'm I'm the type of nigga that goes or that had gone into, like, Barnes & Nobles on Saturday afternoons when shit wasn't popping or if I didn't have shit to do and picked up, you know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, uh, Richest Man in Babylon, um, uh, the book on uh, from Michael Eric Dyson on Jay-Z, um, books on entrepreneurship. Um, books on business strategy. Like I got so many fucking books um, that is kind of wild books on investing. And it, it makes me not to sit up here and make it seem like I'm some type of, uh, uh, you can call me a nerd, but not even about being a nerd or just make it seem like I know it all, but it just opens your mind to understanding what this shit really is and how this money game really works. Um, and I just am a proponent that us as black folks, we just don't know how to play the game at a high enough level. And while it's true that uh, some of us that have made it, we don't always come back and give to our communities. And like a lot of that is twofold. Um, you got individuals who don't want to come back because when you come back to the hood, you have to realize when you come out the hood and you make it and you step out into the real world of really making money, you're, you're on a higher level of thinking. And it's not to say that you're better than that, than the person that's in the hood, because you realize the reason why you're coming back, you realize that you look at the people in the hood as people, you look at them as like yourself before you made it out. <laughs> but the issue becomes because you have a higher level of thinking and they have such a lower level of thinking and they're on top of each other. It's systemic. The, the, the level of ignorance that is within the hood comes out and people, i.e. Nipsey hustle niggas do some dumb shit to end you and you actually helping to rebuild your hood. And so it becomes, it becomes such imminent that the cycle will continue this way until the education of people starting at a very young age understand how to play this money game and to get more people out and more people to help each other along the way. And that's why I feel like, you know, all of these people that's coming out, all these organizations pledging all of this money, you know, Jordan pledging a hundred million over the next 10 years to social justice, the NFL 250 million to social justice. Like social justice is not a, issue that money is going to solve. Um, that's legislation. The, the issue that money will solve is education, nonprofits, organizations that's going to take the time out to actually teach kids in these impoverished communities how money works to give them a head up. That's what's going to help Black people out. And Black people have to be receptive to those things and understand that the game of life is a long one. We look at life so short, i.e. not just because of the police and our dealings with them, but because, again, when you're in your own community, you're on top of each other. If we keep it in six stacks, you can get down by this. You, the, the likelihood of you getting down by a cop is, is not even the same likelihood of you getting down by the nigga that you grew up with or that lives in the, your community. So you have to you have to understand that while those things are true, the only way for you to really come out of this situation is to really educate yourself about the money game and really come up. And that's why I'm like, all of that bread needs to go to, in my opinion. Yeah, man, I totally agree with you. Um, I totally agree, man. It's, 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 it's way bigger than just redirecting our funds and re and putting it towards somewhere else, man. Like you said, we have to understand how this game works and we have to you know really get good at the game you know what i'm saying and even even touching your point because that was very interesting to me you know that you said how people how some black folks make it but don't want to come back to the hood or to wherever they came from i mean on one hand 
you know, you look at things like, damn, you can't get back on the other hand. It's like, I don't blame you, dog. Because, you know, kind of like with Nipsey Hussle or with how um, Lil Boosie has said, where he was like, you know, most rappers get killed from where, from where, they, from where they're from and people from where your hood are, in your hood be hypnotized with hatred, man. It's really that, it's really that, that crabs in the barrel mentality. Like, you know, people throw that, throw that phrase around all the time, but that's really the truth. How because we're so we're so on top of each other, like we we hinder our progress. When one person starts to get to the top, we want to bring them down so they're the next to us because we're at the bottom. And I think that's that's definitely a a huge issue within our community, you know. But like we said before, we have so many issues in our community that we have to solve. We can't address them all at once. We gotta we gotta pick one and roll with it. You feel what I'm saying? And right now, because of the climate we're in, that's uh, police reform. But I really hope that this leads into us moving towards how we really fix the inner workings and the infrastructure within our communities so that we can, you know, thrive with one another and, you know, dispel some of the bullshit that we put ourselves through. That's big facts. You know, man, it's uh, that Malcolm, you sent me a Malcolm X clip the other day, um, which he touched on a lot of valuable things. But um, I guess right after kind of shortly after he was kind of exiled from the Nation of Islam, um, he went and kind of created his own path within that. And he was talking about, you know, there can't be any unity as a whole culture of black people and white people until there's unity within the black community. Um, and those are things of facts on a like and a lot of people don't want to hear that. And I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a person that just goes with the flow just because niggas want to, you know, go with what what they feel like everybody else is going with. I go with what I feel and I mean. I stand 10 toes on everything that I say. So for me, I look at the shit and I'm like, that's facts. Like as black folks, we have so much power, so much, we, we have so much going for us now that a Malcolm X of this generation needs to emerge. A Martin Luther King of this generation needs to emerge because why the resources we have are more abundant. And the reality of these situation is we have to galvanize each other because we're so splintered on so many different fronts. You know, a lot of things we can't control. Police reform and defunding the police is one issue that definitely needs to be tackled, hopefully through legislation. Again, legislation is the key to all of this. People need to understand something about politics. The most powerful people in the world are not the politicians themselves most times. It's the lobbyists. I worked for a consulting and lobbying firm in which that was part of our jobs. Going to actually sit, I, I met with former Speaker of the House. Um, damn, I can't even think of my man's name. He just had a brain freeze. Um, shit, the former Speaker uh, of the House, um, John, uh, damn, damn, I can't remember his name. <laughs> it's going to come to me. Uh, but basically, you would think that when it comes to politicians, it's the people who are lobbying, who are pushing these things, these agendas forward. We need to be on more of those side of things as well. Like black people, we make up 13% of the population. I heard Charlemagne bring up a valuable point that we should be 13% in all industries and fields. We should make up at least 13%. We should be able to infiltrate into every field and have it to where we are present in every form and fashion and i just think that like i said man i'm all for defunding the police um you know kind of as we wrap this episode up um we will definitely have you know we look forward to having um a, a police officer on who actually serves out here in these streets to kind of give their perspective because i think that again dialogue is the only way to kind of move forward, at least from some from a certain standpoint. Like, don't get it twisted. We're not here to um, take sides or anything like that. We we have our own positions, um, but it's good to hear the voice of someone who is living the life, so to speak. Um, and we also have some other council members, um, state board people to come on. To kind of give their opinion from a higher uh from a higher uh higher view standpoint and so like i said police reform is important
but we can't let we can't really let get lost um you know the other issues that kind of plague ourselves and like i said man financial education man i know a lot of people say man a lot of people are suffering out there and they're so right but there's so many different things that we can learn that we just don't have knowledge of we're ignorant to i mean hell warren buffett is a billionaire warren buffett started investing in stocks when he was nine years old that's because he knew better <laughs> Right. Like he knew better. He knew shit. We didn't even know shit that we wouldn't even think about at the time. Yeah. We didn't have as much money and people probably saying, well, how did he accumulate that type of money? But the point is we do have money. We just choose to spend it on different things. We have to redirect our wealth into our communities and redirect that wealth into making bigger profits for ourselves and our communities and for each other. That's the only way we're going to win from this, from the economic standpoint. I pray I look forward to the day that we are paid out reparations. But can we honestly say if we were paid out reparations, how many niggas would actually invest that bread to make more bread or how many niggas would actually be out here just buying some shit to stunt? Those are honest and factual questions. Some niggas might not like to hear that. So what? <laughs> no real shit. No, that's definitely facts. Like, what are you going to do with the reparations? Like, like really, like what? Are, if it if it has if it comes down to really just being like 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 money, what are you gonna do about it? You know what I'm saying? Oh, we're gonna do with it rather. Um, but I had a brain freeze myself. You, you brought up a good point. Oh, about uh, us needing an MLK and a Malcolm X of, of today, and it's kind of interesting you say that because I had a, a a convo about that like two days ago, and this is my viewpoint on it. I think that that it would be hard for us to have a have a MLK and a Malcolm X today because of social media. And I say that because social media gives social media we have too many voices. So everyone has has a platform. And when everyone has a platform, it becomes harder to get on one page. Back in the day in the 50s, 60s, where you only had you know, one or two, maybe three voices, it was easier to get people on the same page to, for example, go go to Selma on a for that for that for that bloody Sunday or to organize people for a million man march, which is later mm -hmm. on obviously. But you know, the gist I'm getting is, is that social media has created a atmosphere where we have too many voices, too many different differing opinions and it's hard for someone to lead when everyone is talking. That's just that's just my honest opinion on that. And secondly, I feel like let's let's take let's take Malcolm X and drop him in today. Let's take MLK and drop him in today. I think it would be they may not have the same effect like they did before. Not saying because because they're both great great speakers, but because people will have access to their to their to their demons and to the things that we don't know about them that, you know, may shade or may throw shade on their reputations. Like, for example, like, I didn't know this until I watched the movie Selma. I didn't even know that MLK was having an affair. You know what I'm saying? Imagine if MLK was doing what he did, doing what he did back then, now, and then people found out about that on social media. They would have a field day and destroy his character. Because he did that one thing, everything else he did for black folks would, wouldn't even matter. Same thing with, with, with Malcolm X. People would look at his his criminal background like, why are we going to listen to a guy that was in jail for six years or whatever the case may be, and all because now all of a sudden he's 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 a he's a reformed new black new man. Like now, nah. people people literally would have those opinions on him. You know what I'm saying? And then, you know, that's how social media goes. Like, it's hard to get people on, on one accord. It's, not saying that they wouldn't be effective or they couldn't be effective because they're, you know, in my opinion, two of the most important black men in our history, at least in, 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 in American history. So I just think that instead of us necessarily looking for that next leader, I think what we should be doing is trying to galvanize our opinions as much as possible so we can be on the same same page and then we can move on. And then, you know, if a leader, if a leader emerges 
out of out of that group, you know, so be it. I, I would I would applaud it because as we all need leaders, we all need a face to to lean on, someone to look up to, in terms of our 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 goals and our aspirations. That's just human nature as well. So, yeah, man, that's that's basically my my opinion. I, on I, that, I, man. I, I agree with you. Um, you know, you brought up a very valuable point with social media. Um, and I agree with you, and I, I think, you know, I, I, I agree with you to the extent that I think that you're right, they would have been criticized, but I think you, you I think for me, you kind of added what they're, what both of them had the ability to do um, kind of towards the end, which is, like you said, galvanize. And while we can galvanize our voices together, it's not the same. It's not even the same, like, as, like, so let's look at modern day. Let's take the modern day black person who we could say did that for black people. And that's obviously Barack Obama. Um, and even Obama was scrutinized and, and, and criticized for things he didn't do and how he maneuvered. And absolutely, you know, Obama thrived and survived a, a social media era that wasn't in its full bloom as it is now, but definitely when it was at its heights um, and in its infancy and kind of development, Obama stood in the forefront and people had a lot to say, questioning his blackness, questioning his motives, I think, but he still had that unique ability um, that Malcolm X Martin Luther King, um, so many other great African men and women leaders, um, you know, Rosa Parks, uh, Harriet Tubman, Frederick Duck, like people who can galvanize people, people that you want to go to bat for, people that you look at and you say, you know what I'm saying, I know they got some fuck shit with them or some fucked up shit about them as far as their past, but the shit that they saying and what they believe in, I can ride with that because that's just how real of the shit that they're saying. Um, and so I agree with you, you know, it probably would have been a little, it probably would have been looked a lot differently. Um, and that's kind of our issue though. You, you know, like for me, um, social media is tough. You know, it's a great platform if used ac you know, accurately or, or effectively, excuse me. Um, but in the same breath, social media is very, it's like looking through murky water. You know what I'm saying? You you don't never know what you're gonna get. Um, you can't see at the bottom, see to the bottom of it. It's it's not clear at all. Um, everything that's put out there is put out there for a reason. We put stuff out there on social media to project things we want people to see as individuals. So obviously things are put out there for us to respond to by companies, by other media platforms, so that we can respond. Like we that's that's the whole purpose of it. And so you're you're right about that. And, you know, like I said, man, like hopefully um, we can continue this conversation um, about defunding the police and, you know, how do police officers feel about that when we say that to them? And, you know, just hearing from uh, local lawmakers, um, you know, what their views on it is. Uh, because right now it's popular. Right now, black people, we have a lot of, you know, it 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 is a it is a new day in America. I can say that um, it is definitely a new day in America, and that's because it's a new day around the world, um, and that's a beautiful thing. But hopefully, we can we can ride this momentum into something greater, and you know, starting with defunding the police yeah. of sorts. Mm -hmm. No, no, for sure, man. And um, just to add some more some more context to, to the topic about like MLK and Malcolm X of today, I'm not saying it's not possible. I'll just bring it up. i just playing devil advocate in, in a sense. But I do, on on the flip side, like you said, their reach would, their reach could have been stronger than it was. Like imagine that. Like imagine Malcolm X being who he is today and the a reach he would have because of his association mm -hmm. with with Islam. How he, you know how how many people worldwide would have been on the same accord and how that would have how that could push America to make change for Black folks. Just imagine that. You know what I'm saying? Like 
if you think about it, like if, if if we're since we're since we're on the world stage as being one of the, one of the powers on Earth, if the whole world is pushing for us to make a change, we're going to do that so we can save save face with our with our foreign allies and you know and our trade partners, etc. So I do think that Malcolm X and MLK could, could have an even stronger reach, even further reach rather than they did back in the day. Just because social media allows you to be so accessible to people, and that's really what—that's really the 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 crux of the matter, man. Is that social media allows you to be personable with people that you would never ever have a chance with, or have a chance to even meet. But you can follow you can follow their lives, and you can see what they're up to. Although we although we do know that people only put what they want us to see on social media, but just based on the general sense, can you imagine? Scrolling through MLK's uh, uh, page and seeing his story every day, like what what he what he be up to, like people would would love to see that, and just being able to gather that that kind of influence would definitely help their their campaigns or you know their their goals and what they were trying to accomplish. So I do think social media the the positive outweighs the negative. In, in that context for them. I was just saying no he's a devil's advocate, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, yeah. But like you said, man, we're definitely um we could probably wrap it up there, man. We're definitely excited to, you know, continue this talk about defunding the police and have some actual police officers and some policymakers come on and, and give their opinion because you know that, that's the whole point of the podcast is that we, we want to give our listeners an inside opportunity to really see and sit down and hear the perspective of those that are really out there in the field, whether you're a police officer or you're a politician, really see and hear how they think. You know what I'm saying? That's and that's one thing I think that we that we offer that other podcasts are not offering is that we're given perspectives from those that are really in the field. You feel what I'm saying? The black perspective, the black male perspective. You know what I'm saying, of course, right. we want to have black women on here because we love our black women and want to get their opinion. and want to get their opinion as well. So being able to to provide that to our audience is what I think makes us special, man. And um, mm-hmm. yeah. Oh, almost forgot. Everyone listening, June twentieth, from twelve to three p.m., the LA Report podcast is holding a Juneteenth Freedom Walk. Uh, we're doing this to commemorate the liberation of black people from slavery. Um, And we also want to, you know, stand in solidarity and show our ancestors that we are fighting and we are continuing to fight. You know, although that, although we may be free in one sense, but we're still fighting for equality in the country that they built. So, you know, we also want to extend out, you know, our thoughts, prayers, and the resources to those that lost their lives to police brutality. And we thought that having a freedom walk you know, where we where we combine these two two ideals to meet would be a great way to show, you know, commemoration for the holiday and you know, just pay respects to those that, that have lost their lives. So the uh the Freedom Walk is gonna be taking place. The start route is gonna start is gonna start from the African American Civil War Museum. Then we're gonna walk to the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And then from there we're gonna walk to the Martin Luther King Memorial. And in total, that's about three miles. And we chose that distance because black people are three times more likely to be killed by police than white people are. We wanted to to, to choose that number because it was symbolic to what's going on in our country today. So, you know, we wanted to really create something that encapsulates the black experience and what we're going through. So, um be on the lookout for that. We're going to post our flyer on, of course, on all of our social medias. We're also going to have guest speakers. We're going to announce them in the next coming days. So, so stay on, stay tuned for that. And if you have any ideas you want to, you, you want to offer or any kind of help you want to offer, please feel free to reach out to us on Twitter, Instagram, you know, or, or our email. Our email is on our Instagram page. We're definitely open to any kind of any suggestions, any help that people. Would want to get most definitely man um so you guys be on the lookout for that information um it's going to be a great great day a great time to uh again walk 
in solidarity, um, showing respect to the past. And also, um, we want to celebrate who we are as a people as well. Um, Because being black is dope. And don't ever let anybody tell you anything different. And so with that, uh, we appreciate you guys rocking with us for another episode. Um, Please, again, let us know what you think. Let us know if you have opinions. If you would like to be on the show and provide some context, um, always hit us up. Again, all social media platforms, our email address as well. Um, But again, thank you guys for rocking with us. Peace.